Lester, Wish Your Engineer. I received a request on one of my recent videos from one of my viewers to test a cheap and easy to build DIY weapon design that they had developed. My viewer calls their design the Cable Saber, and I thought that it had some interesting potential to be addressed in the video because I've performed, uh, I have not actually yet performed any kind of testing of whip like weapons using our impulse block setup. My viewer has built a couple of variants of the design, has been training with it, and has also been taking it with them on bushwalks for basic protection. Their design is essentially a whip made from a length of steel cable. In that regard, it is uh, very similar to a number of other variants of, uh, the, uh, of types of cable whip self-defense weapon. Most notably, uh, the Stinger self-defense whip, which has been favorably reviewed by a number of big channels on YouTube and which I've mentioned in a past video on pain compliance techniques. However, in my viewer's case, their design incorporates a slightly thicker, longer and more robust steel cable, a saber style grip complete with hand guard and a 65 gram weighted tip. My viewer wanted to build a uh, basically indestructible self-defense weapon that they could carry uh, around with them easily. Of course, in Australia, it is essentially illegal to carry a weapon for use in self-defense. So I would not be carrying anything like the cable saber around with me outside of the boundaries of my own property. So purely as an academic exercise, I decided to build my own version of the cable saber to test in a video and perhaps tweak the design a little uh, to satisfy my own uh, specific personal requirements. Okay, to be honest, it was probably also because it looked like, uh, it looked like a prop from a Mad Max movie. So some good post-apocalyptic fun. Oh, what a day! What a lovely day! At first, I built a simple core design that looked like this. To build this, I used a length of galvanized steel cable with a diameter of approximately eight millimeters that I had lying around. This is a bit thinner than the steel cable that my viewer used, but I had this lying around and I didn't want to have to buy any new materials to build this project. I typically don't have much of a budget uh, for most of my projects. I spot welded the steel cable to a length of 12 millimeter diameter threaded rod that would form the center core of the handle. And then I welded the other tip of the, of the cable to seal it and prevent the wires from unraveling when used. I carved a grip out of a piece of seasoned Morton Bay ash wood that I had in my scrap box. I drilled a hole down the middle of it and I fixed it to the thread just using some nuts. In addition, I cut and hammered a, a simple but functional hand guard for the cable saver out of six millimeter thick aluminum, which I added to the hilt before tightening dem nuts. And that was that. Very simple design and build. It took me a few hours over a couple of days to complete, but could probably be done fairly easily in a single day. I was dragging my heels a little bit. I kept the final look of the cable saber uh, quite rough and utilitarian to keep with the post-apocalyptic Mad Max aesthetic. However, I did deviate from my viewer's design by using a longer length of cable, and at least initially, uh, for, the initial for, the, for the tests on the impulse block, I did not weight the tip. My cable saber's overall length is approximately 107 centimeters, so just over a meter. I decided to deviate in these ways so that I could compare the cable saber's performance in the tests to the performance of my cold steel polypropylene uh, shamrock, which as you can see does not have a weighted tip. I have both the longer and the shorter versions of the cold steel shamrock, the shorter of which is, which is this one, is identical in length to the cable saber that I made, but it's made out of lighter polypropylene plastic. 
My initial cable saber design weighed 547 grams, so just over half a kilogram, while the Shambuck weighs uh, 380 gra 384 grams, so considerably lighter. The Shambuck is more rigid than the cable saber as well, due to the gradual taper towards the tip of the weapon. So at the base of the handle here, you can see it's actually pretty thick and tapers to a, uh, a much smaller diameter. However, both weapons are still what I would class as whip-like whip -like weapons. I decided to first do a couple of fun tests using the initial cable de saber design against a variety of different objects. So that's from that strike. I'll put it, well, that's quite an extensive crack. Nearly, oh, more than half of the way around the perimeter of the coconut. Yeah, wouldn't want to get hit by that, but it definitely doesn't. It definitely doesn't cut. Might be able to tear if um, used with enough aggression, but probably not. You can see how the might be able to see how the pattern of the steel wire has actually printed itself in the plastic here. Nasty. Very nasty. Because the um, coconut was thrown out of its net during the test, it may not be clear from the footage that the coconut was actually fractured by the cable saber prior to hitting the ground. So a takeaway from that is that bones that are fairly exposed and not covered by layers of muscle, fat or other tissue may possibly be broken by that kind of impact. It was clear from the bottle test though that flexible targets are not easily cut or chopped by the cable saver, clearly, because it's, it's not what you would call sharp or uh, it has no real edges to it. However, an examination of the bottle indicated that besides causing great pain, there may have also been significant damage caused to any living tissue um, from, a, from strikes like the ones that are performed against the bottle. Perhaps leading to injuries such as severe bruising, uh, shallow internal bleeding, or perhaps worse. In terms of the use of the cable saver, aside from the larger swinging strikes used in the majority of the tests, smaller, more linear, whip-like strikes can also be used. These may not carry as much energy or impact force but could be quite difficult to parry or avoid because of their speed and unpredictable, flexible path. These kinds of strikes could be devastating if launched against sensitive targets, such as the face of an attacker. After the initial fun, we went to the formal testing using our impulse block method and equipment. I have to extend my apologies if you've heard this before, but for those who are new to the channel and are seeing this video without any background information, the impulse block method allows for one of the most comprehensive types of analysis of human striking that is currently available uh, to our knowledge. In a nutshell, the impulse block equipment consists of a specially designed foam spring called the impulse block attached to the front face of a load cell 
that records force input at a sampling rate of approximately 1 kHz, along with a laser photogate timer that allows the measurement of time of flight in microseconds across a 1 cm gap just prior to impact with the impulse block. Using the measured force, values of force per unit time and the time of flight of the impacting object just prior to impact, it becomes possible to calculate a number of other characteristics associated with the impacting object. These include impulse or the change in momentum which would be imparted by the strike, impact velocity, peak filtered impact force, kinetic energy of the impact, power of the impact, and the apparent or effective mass behind the strike. Now I have to do a, a very brief explanation of apparent or effective mass because um, unlike uh, what, what some may uh, assume, apparent or effective mass is not simply the mass of the weapon used in the test or of the part of my body used in, in the strike if I'm, for instance, doing bare hand striking. Um, apparent mass has to be calculated from the impulse value and is actually that portion of the mass of that system, whether it's me wielding a weapon or me on my own, which means my biomechanical system, it is that part of the mass that is actually involved in the impact. For a more detailed explanation of the impulse block equipment and methodology, see my other videos on the subject. The strikes that I performed were all strikes to the side with the impulse block equipment mounted vertically on a wall. I tried to keep my biomechanics similar for all of the strikes in order to keep the tests as objective as possible. However, my personal human variation must be accepted as one of the limitations of this set of tests. I'm not a machine. I can't keep my performance identical, though I try. Um, and uh, I might also say that um, uh, many viewers have suggested that I test weapons using some kind of machine or robot swinging those weapons. I am not actually interested in that kind of test because I am interested in human weapon usage, not weapons as a, as a class on their own, um, apart from a human being wielding them or as wielded by a robot, for instance. That doesn't interest me. So um, on my channel, I am specifically interested in how humans use weapons. I performed a total of seven strikes with each of the two weapons to build up my data set. This is a very small data set. So that should be considered a test limitation. However, the results appear to be quite consistent. This is what the tests looked like. After processing the data, we solved for all of the variables and we calculated the average values for each of the weapons along with the maximum values attained for impulse, impact velocity, peak filtered impact force, kinetic energy of the impact, power of the impact, and apparent mass behind the strike. 
I'll have the data displayed on the screen during my discussion. For the most part, the results were what I expected, although there were a couple of surprises. Not unexpectedly, the impulse generated by both weapons was a little more than half of the impulse generated by weapons such as the flute, nunchaku and tonfa. Clearly because um, it is very difficult to impart momentum with a flexible light weapon such as a whip, even a heavier whip such as the cable saber. So that was not unexpected. The impulse generated by the cable saber was actually on average a full newton second higher than that of the shambok though indicating that the momentum transferred by the heavier cable saber was actually significantly higher. As expected, both weapons struck with much higher velocity than any of the other weapons that I have tested before on this channel on the impulse block. The velocity of these two weapons was on average nearly double the velocity of weapons like the Tonfa, Nunchaku and Flute. This would be due to a combination of the length of the whips being greater than uh, these other weapons that I've tested and also due to the peculiar mechanics of whip-like weapons that allow the tips to reach very high velocities. Longer weapons have greater associated rotational arcs when swung, granting potentially higher impact velocities further along the length of the arc. In addition, whips are designed uh, where well, you could say that they're designed as velocity multipliers. This is a gross oversimplification, but to put things simply, waves traveling along the length of a whip, even a, even a thick whip like this, um, can cause progressively lighter and more flexible whip segments to travel at progressively higher velocities, essentially due to the conservation of momentum principle. The cable saber, being a heavier whip, had a lower impact velocity than the shambok, but a higher associated apparent mass. In addition, the average apparent mass of the cable saver was 33% uh, of the total mass of the weapon, whereas the shambok's uh, apparent mass was actually only 31% of its total mass. This bears out my subjective evaluation of the cable saver's striking potential in that it felt like the cable saver bit into the target more, perhaps uh, because of the stiffer cable or because of the, uh, uh, the friction associated with, the, with the, the, uh, the, the profile, the wires that make up the, um, this, the, the cable, which allowed me to momentarily improve on its apparent mass during the impact event through my own biomechanical bridging or kinetic chaining. However, one of the results that should not have been surprising, but which was still interesting, was that the kinetic energy of both uh, was the kinetic energy of both weapons, in particular the shamrock. This is where you see the effect that higher velocities have on kinetic energy. The average kinetic energy of both weapons was just over 80 joules. This is, this is quite high, but still similar to the kinetic energy of weapons such as Tonfa, the Tonfa, Nunchaku and Flute, which of course travel much, uh, travel much slower, so they have a, a lower uh, impact velocity, but they have a much higher apparent mass behind the, uh, behind the strike. However, the maximum kinetic energy recorded for the Schoenbach was 107 joules. This was higher than that recorded for any of the other weapons tested uh, using the impulse block method on this channel. This is approximately the kind of energy that could be expected from a typical 25 ACP pistol round. Of course, the velocity of the shambok is much lower than a 25 ACP pistol round, but while it's apparent mass and impulse is much higher. So the other impact characteristics do differ, but the energy is almost identical, which is uh, quite interesting. As expected for whip-like weapons, the impact duration for both weapons was very short, leading to very high impact power because the energy was conveyed over a very short, very brief period of time. 
The maximum impact power for both weapons was over 11 kilowatts, significantly outperforming weapons like the Tonfa, Nunchaku and the Flute. Peak force for both weapons was also surprisingly high. Because the impact duration was very short, a surprisingly high peak filtered force was generated for both weapons in order to communicate that impulse to the target. The maximum peak filtered forces generated by both weapons were surprisingly close to the average peak filtered forces generated by weapons like the Tonfa, Nunchaku and Flute. After I completed the tests and had a look at the data, I decided to tweak the design of my cable saber to address some of my own particular personal requirements and concerns. And this is what I came up with. I added some Mad Max style steel studs to the aluminium handguard and I covered the grip in uh, industrial heat shrink. Um, just for spits and giggles, uh, also known as the rule of cool. I also decided to incorporate a weighted tip, as you can see, albeit a much lighter one than my viewer had, uh, my viewers used. For this, I used a hollow threaded bolt that weighed 18 grams, and I welded the tip of the cable, as you can see, to prevent the bolt from flying off. I used a lighter tip to maximize the velocity that could be achieved over the potentially greater impulse and apparent mass that can be conveyed by a heavier tip. Of course, for a given wielder input energy and a given weapon, uh, typically the heavier the tip, the lower the impact velocity will be. Of course, a heavier tip, as I've mentioned, could lead to higher impulse and apparent mass in the impact but I wanted to retain as much of the characteristics of a whip as possible. In other words, a high velocity lashing tip. In addition to the weighted tip, I also wanted to improve the, we the wielder's control over the movements of the whip and perhaps improve on the cable saber's mechanical energy delivery performance. As mentioned before, most longer whips are thicker at the base and taper towards the tip, making the whip progressively lighter and more flexible towards the tip and progressively heavier and stiffer towards the base. This is a purposeful design feature which, as I've mentioned before, acts as somewhat of a mechanical velocity multiplier. As a wave created by the wheel that travels through, uh, it travels along the tapering whip and under the control and influence of the wielder, the velocities of various sections of the whip moving under the action of the traveling wave increase until ultimately the tip can be moving fast enough to break the sound barrier. This creates a tiny sonic boom that we hear as the traditional whip crack. Of course, the weight, stiffness and thickness of whips like the cable saber and the shambuck essentially precludes any kind of supersonic whip crack. However, I did want to maximize the tip velocity by using this design feature. So I wrapped part of the base of my cable saber in adhesive lined heat shrink. You can see a bit of it poking out here. This is continuous all the way to the base here. Um, and I, I covered part of that in turn by a, a, a length, an even shorter length of thick walled polypropylene pipe, uh, the type that you would find in a plumbing supply store. This emulated the progressive taper of a conventional whip to a certain extent, making my cable saver progressively stiffer and thicker as you get towards the base. Despite, uh, and, uh, even though it, it looks fairly rigid here, it is still somewhat flexible, even at the thickest part. This would allow me to emulate a degree of control uh, found in typical long, whip, long whips, and it was my hope that this would allow the tip to be flicked with much greater velocity. This feature combined with the weighted tip made it possible to achieve some very high velocity impacts with high impact force and energy concentrated over the very small impact surface area provided by the hollow bolt head at the tip of the cable saber. The effects of this brutal combination can be seen in some tests that are performed against some hanging coconuts.
There's definitely a lot more force, a lot more impact energy being transferred here. It's very clear. Hit here, the nut, the um, bolt struck here, and uh, cracked the coconut around a large portion of its circumference. It was quite clear to me that I could crack these coconuts with far more ease using the modified cable saver even using small reduced energy flicking attacks. The progressive thickening and stiffening towards the base also increased the level of control I had over the cable saver and decreased the number of unpredictable backswings and ricochets that I had to account for during freestyle work against the iron dummy. So I'll show you a side-by-side -side set of clips showing me using the unmodified cable saber on the left and the modified cable saber on the right against our Changhong iron dummy. So as you can see, um, hopefully as you can see from the side-by-side -side clips, I had a great deal more control um, you, with the with the sorry with the modified cable saber than I had with the unmodified cable saber. The progressive stiffness towards the base of the cable saber also opens up options for soft parry and deflections and controls of an opponent's weapon using certain stiffer sections of the cable saber as you move towards the handle. Of course, the base of the cable saver, as I mentioned, is not fully rigid and thus would not be usable for hard parries or deflections. However, softer weapons can still be used to moment, uh, as momentary contact, contact points with an opponent's weapon to subtly guide the weapon's trajectory or to allow for tactile feedback to the defender so that they can adjust their own movement and strategy. Now, Australian legal restrictions on self-defense aside, a whoop would probably not be my weapon of choice in a serious self-defense situation for a few reasons, mostly based on my own personal preferences. I like to have the option of parrying and deflecting other weapon attacks with a more rigid weapon shaft. Although it's possible, as I've already mentioned, to deflect an opponent's weapon through skillful use of the flexible whoop, this is not easy to do, especially under pressure. A whip typically lends itself more to being employed in an aggressive fashion when used in defense. It's a case of uh, defense through offense, and keeping, your, keeping your opponent at bay. I will say that the cable saber does have the potential to cause debilitating or even potentially fatal injuries when surgically precise strikes are employed. However, performing these kinds of strikes under pressure is also quite difficult, especially when opponents rush in, uh, cl close a defender down and or limit their space in some way. By far the greater majority of the cable saber's strikes will prove extremely painful and cause perhaps cause agonizing wounds on an aggressor, which would class it still as more of a pain compliance weapon. The potential wounds caused by the cable saber will more than likely not stop a determined or enraged aggressor before they charge past the optimum range of the weapon. Of course, at close quarters, the cable saber can then be employed as a glorified knuckle duster. Or the defender can reverse their grip on the cable saber and turn it into a type of, a type of short range Flat. So despite my general reservations about whips 
and pain compliance weapons used for self-defense. I would say that I would be more inclined to use the modified cable saber than any other type of whip for self-defense. Now this was a, a really interesting little project and I'm really uh, grateful to my viewer for suggesting it. So thank you very much. Appreciate the suggestion. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you all again next time. Cheers.